Welcome to Truest Blood, the official True Blood podcast. I'm Kristen Bauer. And I'm Deborah Ann Wool. And you've been invited in. I want to do bad things with you. On Truest Blood. Welcome back to Truest Blood, where we sink our fangs into the series episode by episode. This week, we discuss episode 205, <laughs> entitled Never Let Me Go, written by Nancy Oliver and directed by John Dahl. I like how you do the 205, Deb. I like how you do, you've made that your own now. <laughs> well, you know, it was, we have to have some sort of, you know, consistency throughout the podcast. Christmas. Yeah, I, I love this. Well... You know, there must be something in the sweet tea because things are heating up across the South and the women are taking charge. It's all about sex, but it's also about independence. And if we've learned anything from our Southern media, it's that a dirty mind is a terrible thing to waste. Yes. And then we sat down with the bold and absolutely enthralling Anna Camp. Uh, yes. You may know her from Equus on Broadway with Daniel Radcliffe or the hit Pitch Perfect movies, but so we good. know and love her here as Sarah Newland. Yay. Anna is a prolific performer from Broadway to the big screen. She is always in demand, so we are very lucky for the opportunity to pick her brain, yeah. so be sure to stick around. But first, this week on True Blood. Bill and Sookie find it's a hot time in the Big D as they try to make the most of their getaway. But duty calls when Eric finds the Dallas vamps lacking in the search for Godric. Sookie offers to infiltrate the Fellowship of the Sun. Bill is none too happy about her risking her life, but it's not up to him. And Sookie reminds him that usually the shoe is on the other foot. You're walking in my shoes and it's giving you blisters. Meanwhile, at church camp, Jason is in for a rude awakening when the Soldiers of the Sun is actually an aggressive boot camp experience. But the batting eyes of Sarah Newland keep him going almost as much as his rivalry with Luke. That's how you do it, Stackhouse. Oh, you better pace yourself. This is my pace. <gasps> Sam is gobsmacked to discover that Daphne herself is a shapeshifter. Intrigued, the two escalate their romance. Primal hormones firing on all cylinders, they connect on the Merlot's pool table. Tara awakens after her birthday party surprise to find that Marianne and her entourage plan to stay a while at Sookie's. Tara nixes this idea, only to wonder if she's actually throwing away the one good part of her life right now. You know what this is really about? Your history is so fucked up, you have no clue what family is. That's not fair. I do have a clue. Sort of. Kind of. Marianne uses her powers to give Tara just about the worst day bartending she's ever had, only to be waiting at Sookie's with a warm smile. Tara relents and asks them to stay. Steve and Sarah intensify their plans for Jason, while Steve ushers him off to the inner sanctum, showing off his vampire-killing armory. Now, at first we just focused on the guns, but then we thought, well, hey, what's a wooden arrow? Well, that's a needy bit of steak. Sarah takes a gentler approach and helps Jason to cleanse himself and find joy in her hands. Back in Dallas, having scared off Barry, the telepathic bellhop, Suki readies herself for a big day tomorrow and takes comfort in Bill's embrace. We hear their passion echoing through the halls as Lorena, Bill's maker, strides down the hall, fangs forward. <laughs> So once again, poor Tara, <laughs> it just broke my heart to this whole theme of family and belonging. Yeah. And Marianne just plays her like a fiddle. Oh, oh. I, it's it's it, Marianne is infuriating, but she's also so impressive. I mean, she knows <laughs> yes. exactly what to do to manipulate the people around her. We really see a sinister side of her this episode. We really, really do. You know, when she, you know, Tara is brave enough to say, look, um, it's not my house. Yeah. 
She does exactly so, the right thing. Yeah. Right. I can't actually have everyone move into my friend's no. house. Like I'm not, I'm a visitor too. Yes. And the way that Marianne just, she has the saddest face. Oh. And then she like walks out, you know, she tries to be brave. Okay. Yes. Okay. And walks out of the kitchen. I mean, it's just, that is brutal. Yeah. One, right and there. Too, you know, we've just seen her so happy to wake up next to eggs and having yeah. this, you know, lovely, after the first good birthday party of her life. and Of her she, life. You know, she's moved in with Suki, you know, in a house that felt like yeah. a home for her. You feel so much for her. I think they're doing a real service for Tara, actually, this this season, mm -hmm. because she is so we've built her up as this very intelligent, very skeptical. And she says it later. She's like, I'm just trying to not get taken. Right. Right. So they set her up as being this really, you know, she she just suffers no fools. Right. Yeah. So she's we have to really justify mm -hmm. her allowing Marianne to get this deep into her, you know, get her hooks so deep in, into 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 Tara. And so I think they're doing a good job of really mm -hmm. laying the guilt, laying her family history, mm -hmm. you know, seeing every little way that that Marianne is manipulating her that so that I don't lose an ounce of respect for Tara through this process because you really see, mm -hmm. man, they're working on her from all angles. And mm -hmm. I would easily, I would fall so much sooner than Tara would. I know that's a really good point because it is her Achilles heel. Yeah. I mean, it is just Family. the deepest wound that she yeah. has. And you pulled this clip that we're going to play in a minute mm. that I thought the same thing. I thought, oh, if someone said that to me right now, I would give them my house. Yes. yes. You know, it's really, really well written. And and but first, you know, <laughs> first we have the terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day that Tara has. Yes. <laughs> So Marianne is now manipulating yes. both sides of the coin. You know, I think Tara's on drugs. Tara, are you high? Okay, I wish I was where everybody's dogging me. Tara? Tara! 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 Fuck all of y'all! <laughs> oh, and then we cut to, so that's outside Merlot's, right? So Marianne's out there doing yeah. her magic in the parking lot creating horrible vibes, yes. directing it all at Tara inside Merlots. And then after she goes, she looks so happy. <laughs> Marianne is just thrilled with her work. We're done here. Yeah. And they we're, try right. she goes, We're but done I, here. That whole sequence. And I, you know, I want to give credit to John Dahl and everyone who's putting this together because yeah. that whole sequence in Merlots, the music, the acting, the cut, you know, the way that it's cut together. Um, really fast cuts. Boy, do I, I get anxiety just yes. watching it. So again, yes. it's this real sort of support for Tara's story so that we go right along with her. Um, there's yeah. even, I didn't, I didn't pull it and maybe, maybe we will, but at the beginning, they've got the two Merlot's regulars. And when they're angry, he, he looks over to her and he's like, you don't even need more food. Your butt's as big as a, uh, oh, what is right. it here? Your butt's as big as a Buick or something. She looks at him and she goes, well, you look like you're pregnant. <laughs> it's just like <laughs> the like angriest, most like needle sharp <laughs> insults right. for coming from some of our, our co-stars that episode. It was just wonderful. So wonderful. And then the next orchestration Tara yeah. goes back to Suki's house, back to her home now. And Marianne is like June Cleaver. <laughs> she's like, she's well, grand. She's grand. And and yeah. you'll notice if you listen, they even play grand's theme. The yes, music in I the wrote background. that in my notes. And I yeah. was like, wait, I was trying, I was coming up with the words in my head. I was like, wait, they played that song. Yeah. But her Brilliant. hair is back in that low bun. She's wearing an yes. apron. She's reading a book. And it has all yeah. the markings of really, you know, who Gran was for Suki, but for many times for Tara as well. And especially yeah. we start this episode with her missing Gran. Um, and oh. boy, is that a strong manipulation. She goes, she goes, I, yeah. I made you dinner. All your, I, I stocked, stocked the, the fridge, fridge with your favorite things. Um, ah. And, and we, we looked for homes. We didn't find any, but we'll be gone in the morning. You know, like Tara's oh putting them out on the Lord. street. 
it is perfection it from is. Marianne. I know, and then she delivers that line. Mm. You know why I'm good to you? Because you need it so much. And because it makes you bloom like a flower. Oh, my heart. Killing me. Killing me. Nancy, you're killing me, man. I know. Absolutely. If someone said that to me, and you know, Mishka and Michelle, in person, yes. yeah. you know, that to me, she's such an incredible actress. Yeah. Because she says things like that to me as a friend, <laughs> right? And and it really is so heartfelt. Mm. And in that moment, I believe actually that Marianne <laughs> believes it even, you know? Yeah. I mean, I believe that, that like Marianne needs to be Tara's savior. Mm -hmm. And so she really does need Tara to bloom, but it, right. it has to be at her hands. You know, it's that, right. it, it's, it's, it's that selfish need to help someone else in, in, in that twisted way. Um, it is. It's, I guess it's that narcissism thing yeah. that we yeah. hear so much about today. <laughs> that is such a real boy for the victims. It's yeah. in, impossible to discern. Yes. And you can really see that at play through, you know, these performances and the writing. Mm -hmm. So the next really, I mean, show changing, series changing mm -hmm. moments that happens this this episode is the introduction yeah. of Godric via yeah. this flashback. Boy, did this have a gigantic impact on the show, on the fans, mm -hmm. on Eric's storyline. And it is really a beautiful scene that they've you know constructed. isn't that sequence just so stunning oh. oh my gosh wow the casting i mean alan mm. hyde who plays godrick is so beautiful he, and and intense i mean and intense his, i cannot tear my eyes away from his yeah. face me too in that moment and and oh and there's something so incredible the way Nancy has written it, you know, one, it's all in Swedish, which is so exciting for an American audience because it, it it really yeah. feels like this is another time and place, especially, <laughs> you know, because of it that. It really does. Um, but they don't say the word vampire. And, and I love that because, you know, having not done the research, they probably wouldn't. Right. Right. They call him death. Right. And I think that's such a smart writing choice. Um, yes. You know, he asked, could you be a companion of death? Ooh. Ooh, that's a really good point, Deb. I, I didn't think of that. It's like life and death and these yeah. bizarre dichotomies. Like if you choose to be the companion of death, you yeah. will live forever. Right. <sighs> right? Yikes. I mean, I, I was watching this thinking this it, people have asked so, me for years <laughs> why are people so into vampires? And I thought yeah. watching that scene, oh, this is why. Because There's so this, many of the us. The answer is somewhere in here, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. The answer is somewhere in here to that ultimate brutal reality and vulnerability that we will all die. Yeah. And this is like, ah, no, <laughs> these special chosen gods yeah. won't. Well, what's interesting is that in that same moment, though, where we're talking about being a god and living forever, what mm -hmm. we needed in order to understand Eric better is actually mm -hmm. to humanize him, which right. we do literally in these right. in this flashback and figuratively, right. because all we've seen is kind of, again, a cold Eric who mm -hmm. cares only about his bar and yep. what he needs. No and vulnerability. Now, no vulnerability. But we see a very vulnerable Eric, still strong. Yeah. Yes. But we're starting to see what matters to him, what he loves. Mm -hmm. And Who we he needed was. that, you know, yes. after what he's done throughout the series, the way he's used Sookie, what he's done to Lafayette. Yes. We needed to see that he is motivated by something we can relate to as human beings. So, yeah, we have this incredible line, even though it's in Swedish, we're going to play it for you now. Oh, for you, I told her. Leave. Leave. 
just uh, again, isn't that just beautiful? And it is true that the Swedish. I don't know, it's American. I'm just so enamored with people who can talk that funny talk. You know, it's just, <laughs> that's what I, I always call it with my husband who speaks Afrikaans and with Alex. And then I had to talk funny talk. But yeah, it's it's really another time and place. And yeah, and, and, but I love that, again, these are such consummate actors that mm. even without the subtitles, mm-hmm. I may not understand exactly what they're saying, but I know what they're talking about. You That's know, I can point. tell yes. that this is life or death. I can tell that there's an offer being made. And even that, even just listening to that clip and you hear the crackle of the fire in the mm-hmm. background, no music. They've chosen not to have that here. And I think mm-hmm. that is such a smart choice. Mm-hmm. But boy, does that scene just leap off the screen. It leaps, it leaps. And such an interesting choice to to cast Alan Hyde because he mm. is so young. He's 19 mm. as an actor playing the role. But yet we feel that he's thousands of years old, <sighs> 2,000 years old. Yeah, and he's that, is, just, that is a man, a precocious young man. <laughs> that is a precocious <laughs> young man. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of other scenes. Right, and speaking of precocious. precocious and yeah, other right? scenes that leap off the screen, <laughs> we're going to jump right to the very end. We have this amazing shot as our cliffhanger oh. with Lorena. Boy, I went back and I found that scene in the script because I was like, look at oh, this. Oh, yeah. She talks about a flowing dress. She talks okay. about the slow mo. She talks oh. about you know the the wry smile and the the, the oh. fangs sort of come out as she listens. So a lot of that is in in the script. But oh boy, gosh. that Lorena theme music too as she's coming oh. down the hallway as we're listening to Bill and Sookie and thinking they're happy. <laughs> Poor Bill it's- and Sookie. Poor Bill and Suki. And that is the thing with True Blood, right? It, it, we're only happy and comfortable for seconds yes. ever. Yes. And when she rounds that corner, Ooh. Mariana Cliveno, and in that dress and that walk and that hallway and that lighting and that yes. beautiful luminous skin she just has, yes. it really is a, an unbelievably kooky cliffhanger. Gorgeous. <laughs> And just that sexy, gentle, it's a gentle fang extend. You know, and I, I love as the show goes on, you're going to see all us vampires get real sick of doing that, you know, yeah. same sort of fang bear. So, so we start to find lots of different ways to bear our fangs. Yeah, that's true. We do. And now for a quick bite, the anatomy of a flashback. We start with a question from Bill. All this for a colleague, for the sheriff of Area 9. Why? Eric's eyes drift away from Bill as though picturing a moment from his past, and we move in quickly towards his eyes, entering his thoughts. Flashbacks are a common storytelling device. It is often advised to use them sparingly, but when done well, they can add incredible texture to a story giving an audience insight into the private thoughts of a character without them having to speak a word of it aloud. Many filmmakers in this episode, as no exception, choose to light and film a flashback in a distinctly different style than the rest of the story. You'll notice in Eric's flashback that the colors are less saturated. Everything is earth-toned, and the focus is more extreme, each shot blurring around the edges. More shown in close-up as we are in a way witnessing Eric's memory, which is more subjective than our main story. Flashbacks often also take place in a bygone era, requiring extensive research and attention to detail by every department. Costumes and props would have researched Viking battle clothing and weaponry. And Godric's tattoos would have been the result of the makeup department diving into ancient Scandinavian artistry to find whatever scant evidence exists from 2,000 years ago. All this for a mere five minutes of screen time. But all this to also immerse you in Eric's experience, a day he never forgot and a day that changed him forever. And so we return to the present. Now we pull back from his eyes and his memory, and we already know what his answer will be. Godric is my maker. But it means more to us because we know exactly what it means to him. (laughs) 
So our, our deep dive topic today, <laughs> I feel like if, if Nancy Oliver had a thesis statement for this episode, it would be, you know, women owning their sexual power. Yeah. Uh, because the ladies in this ep, they know yeah. what they want and they know how to get it. <laughs> yeah. And I'm not sure what it is about this episode, but, you know, maybe in the words of Arlene. It's in the air, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Looks like it. See you at work. Right. <laughs> Come on, special lady. <laughs> so delightfully I love awkward. That whole sequence. <laughs> it is so awkward. So yeah, see you at work. Yeah. <laughs> so we can jump right in with Daphne and Sam, who were caught. Yeah. Uh, you know. <laughs> Clo yes, yeah. uh, clo the clothing list shifter interrupt this. That's a very good one. Yeah. You know, Sam has now just made an extraordinary discovery, which is that Daphne is a shifter like him. How cool that Nancy chose for her to reveal this to Sam in this way. Yes. Dropping her clothes as he <laughs> picks them up. Yes. Right. He finally he's like, hey, come on. And he says something like, come on, little girl. I'm not I, in right. the mood I'm for not, this. I don't have time for this little girl. Yeah. Right. Very Southern. Um, Very Southern. And then she is A, naked, and then yes. B, a doe. A doe. Well, and it's fascinating, actually, that the shifter thing requires nudity, right? Mm -hmm. Like they're like in D&D, &D, <laughs> your clothes shift with you. So when oh, you pop back right. in, you're, you know, fully clothed and equipped. But okay. in True Blood world, the yeah. clothes don't go. And, and of course, right. animals are, quote unquote, naked all the time. So right. it's this, there's this weird comfortability with nudity that the shifters have that right. is really interesting for them, that especially when it comes to interesting. sex. Yeah, you're right. That is a really good point because we did not have that in the vampire world. Yeah. And thank God, because poor Sam was out there naked at oh. Greer in 19 degrees in jazz shoes running through that woods for seven yeah. years. But we have one of one of my favorite lines at the beginning of this episode from Daphne um, mm. because she's she's really read him so well you're carrying that secret like a two-ton sack of feet on your back and it doesn't have to be that way secret what secret fibber <laughs> she's so southern i love it she's so good yeah. she's so southern and so wonderful and oh my god it was great to interview her so anywho yeah the nudity thing is really interesting and can you imagine mm-hmm being not even knowing what you are being the only one yeah. of what you are and then all of a sudden this chick that you had attraction to anyway yeah. is what you are and she's proud of it she's yeah. confident i mean you know this yeah. is why i think as as we talk about sort of women and their sexual power in this episode yeah. part of what's so wonderful about it is that she has no shame about any of right. this she right. is very proud of who she is and what she wants. And she is leading him through the woods. Yeah. And then as we come to their love scene at the end of the episode, you know, Sam is very happy to be <laughs> in there with her, but she is still yeah. sort of leading the charge. Yeah. And they start to describe what shifting feels like. And it has this very strong sexual overtone to it, which it I love. It sure does. It sure does. The way he describes it, it builds and it builds and it's electric and then you explode yeah. and and you feel it. And also she led the seduction because he she disappeared on him at the party. Yep. Then at Merlot's, he's like, hey, where'd you go? And I forget exactly <laughs> what she says, but she's like, oh, I didn't think you could handle it is what she I didn't says. Think you could handle it or something. <laughs> and then he goes, well, I hope that you whatever, give me a chance or something. And she goes, yeah, yeah you know, maybe I will or I will or. So she leads the whole thing. Yeah. And she goes, do you feel it here? Do you yeah. feel it here? The whole, it's a great, and I love how it's backlit. It was beautifully yes. shot. It's so gorgeous. Isn't it gorgeous? Where yes. you're not seeing the typical directorial shots of each person's face cutting back yeah. and forth. Yeah. You've got them in a two shot backlit. Mm -hmm. You know, again, unlike the flashback scene where we feel like we're mm -hmm. in Eric's brain and even though we're mm -hmm. seeing Eric, we're sort of seeing it all from his perspective. This was mm -hmm. almost it felt a little like, oh, we're getting to peek in on this lovely moment, 
the beginning of love, you know, nice. and, and in a way it felt, it felt so nice to be on the outside of that, to be able to yeah. witness two people falling in love. And it then it really does exactly was. what I think True Blood does so well, which is that this is sweet and it's sexy, but it is also a little funny. Yeah. <laughs> and as she hops on that table naked and they're getting ready to, to fall back into each other's arms, he says, well, are you going to say it or should I? I would. Nice rack. Nice balls. <laughs> <laughs> I love this show. And you know, I, I love, love how it. Sam does a giggle. He yes. stops and he giggles and gives, you know, it's and such good. And does the punchline. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's such good tracking. Oh, boy. So then our, our next couple that is going to represent female sexual power here is Sarah yeah. and Jason. Really, mm -hmm. Sarah. You know, we start with seeing her being majorly impressed with mm -hmm. Jason during the Soldier of the Sun training. Um, <laughs> boy, she is all kinds of excited by him. <laughs> Anna Camp. Oh, my God. She is just absolutely. But she puts it all, you know, it's so... Oh. It puts it all in God's light, right? Yes. It's like, oh, yes, because you'll be killing vampires. This is really <laughs> great, you know, kind of vibe. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it's, you know, I think, as I said earlier, she uses this idea to sort of attract Jason. It's mm -hmm. sexual, but it's also this, like, this idea of greater good. She's mm -hmm. going to give him purpose, and she's going right. to say, your life is a meaningful one. Mm -hmm. And I think in many ways, that's what attracts him even more. I mean, she's obviously beautiful, and she's, you know, given him those, those beautiful eyes. And, you know, but really, it's that she makes him feel valued. Yeah, he would never go for it if she didn't have yeah. that key. That spark. Which That's is interesting spark. because we get a glimpse into Steve and Sarah's relationship. What's yeah. really going on behind the scenes for them. Yeah. They have this little fight that Jason overhears. And yeah. it's interesting because Sarah is actually the more tempered one. Um, yeah. She's saying, I want to be involved. Why, do, why am I being left out when we're supposed mm -hmm. to be a team? And she mm -hmm. says that whatever they're planning, she thinks it's too far. Mm -hmm. Which is a great insight into, you know, really what's at stake for her in this. It is. And, you know, Steve really dismisses her. Yeah. A couple of times. He just, he dismisses her when they're arguing, goes yeah. right to Gabe. And then she says, that's too far. And Gabe and just takes orders from Steve. He yeah. goes, I got, you know. And then Jason, I love when he walks <sighs> in the room and he goes, hey, you know, did you want me? And she goes, yes. And then just continues <laughs> on with the sentence. She, yes. Oh, yes. She goes, yes. You did so well today. Yeah. So there it is, right? Right? Yeah. And then Steve says, let's go. I want to show you something. And she's like, I'll come too. And they just leave her. Dismiss you really her. see how she has very little power in this household. There's uh -huh. a, a sort of acknowledgement that she should or that they pretend that she does. But when it comes right down to it, Steve is not really respecting her place. Um, in this, no. in this, in this home. Um, and then, but so yeah, yeah, he goes downstairs <laughs> yeah. and says one of the most interesting lines, I think, to Jason. Man, a man, sometimes I almost understand why some people believe in divorce. But you got Sarah. <laughs> yeah. I got her even when I don't want her. <laughs> oh, you know, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> I love it's perfect. It's so perfect. McMillan, the, 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 ha ha ha. Yeah. Just yeah. kidding. So not kidding. Well, you know, we've heard, we've all heard people talk about their spouses in this kind of way. And it's, it's, yeah. it's a weird accepted form of humor about one's partner. Right, and right. I think we can all admit that, you know, not, you know, relations are, are never all, all good or all bad. And yet there's something so mean about mm -hmm. that, especially after mm -hmm. what we just witnessed. It's very efficient because up until this point, we thought that they were the perfect couple. Yeah. And then in that little two minutes, we go, oh, dear. And then it makes so much sense why she's attracted to Jason. Well, you know, mm -hmm. just looking at him, but also why she's justified. Yes. And she's going to 
use that and be that and yeah. be a sexually interested woman who wants to feel seen. Yeah. You know, if, if they're fighting over Jason's attention or, mm -hmm. or Jason's approval and respect, Steve has yeah. all of these ways he can do that, right? He's got the boys club. He's got yeah. the guns. He's got this, he's got religion and this entire camp on his side. Yeah. And she doesn't, you know, right. she's, she doesn't have that. I really see we get to, again, one of the most discussed scenes in the history of True Blood, which is what I'm going to call the holy hand job scene. <laughs> and, you know, I, I really see this as a moment where she is fighting for her independence. She is yeah. making the choice to go after what she desires and what she wants. Yes. Um, independence from her husband, who doesn't respect mm -hmm. her, from a religion who mm -hmm. brands women as sinners and hookers. Mm -hmm. And it leads to this really incredible interaction between them with another one of my favorite lines. Mary Magdalene washed the feet of Jesus and dried him with her hair. Isn't that lovely? Yeah. Well, wasn't she like a hooker? She was not. Everybody thinks so, but... That's not in the Bible. Oh, it's so it's interesting because I bet that's true. You know, I, I bet yeah. we all do think of Mary Magdalene as, oh, she was a prostitute. But mm -hmm. I, I bet Nancy knows, and I'm sure Alan knows. Mm -hmm. It's probably never mentioned. It was probably male reading of that story right. that, that made right. it become that. Um, right. And she, you know, Sarah knows Better and she can see, she can idolize even a Mary Magdalene and want to be like her. Mm -hmm. um, that's just a fascinating scene. It's a fascinating scene. And then she says something along the lines of like, let me help you have a reward. And, yeah, find and joy. <laughs> find joy. And Jason Stackhouse, I mean, are you kidding? He's like, that sounds good well but there's that really good one where you know he says no we shouldn't she goes right. you don't mean that and he says no but i oughta <laughs> <laughs> so you know he has he has a strong conscience jason he just doesn't he, listen to it God very often love him. you know he does he his does. heart is almost always telling him yeah. the right thing to do and it's not like, it's not that letting her do this is the wrong thing to do it just just that right. like he knows his heart knows something bigger is happening here. <laughs> right, right. And he's so and this perfect is more for this about show. her yeah. than it is about him. And yeah, he just has trouble really listening to his gut. Yeah. He's thank God he's, you know, on true blood because he all kinds of interesting <laughs> things happen because <laughs> he does not me. listen to himself. Oh <laughs> boy. And then we've got our other couple. Yes. You know, with the horny woman. We got we got Sookie, Sookie and Bill. She is she is so hot for him. Like the minute she, they land in Dallas, because <laughs> there is something in the sweet tea there because she is all over him. She is there to do a job, Sookie. Come on. <laughs> she really is there on their vacation. Yeah. And she's wearing the hotel robe and she's just like. They brought his new kid. <laughs> right. I love, yeah. I will say just sidetrack. It's very funny to me. They like bring Jessica to Dallas and then like, don't give her anything to do. Like what no. do they expect? She's just going to sit in the room next door no. and do nothing yeah. for like four days. Little <laughs> tiny nod to that cute little scene with you and Hoyt though. I have yeah, to say that's so no, cute. Thanks. And how he goes, well, we could watch TV together or I could read to you from my comic book. Like it, <laughs> and then we get to see his bedroom. Yeah. Like, so sweet. They're so they're both earnest. They're both it's very earnest. really cute. But back to the the uh, less earnest adults here. But while she wasn't being earnest and she did order a boy <laughs> off the menu and Sookie runs out in the hall. Yeah. You know, she meets another telepath. Yes. Which I think, you know, is very exciting for her. She, you yeah. know, has never had that happen before. And, you know, and she's on this trip where all these powerful vampires like need her. They yeah. can't, you know, they can't do it themselves. They need right. the, the human telepath. And it's all very confidence building. And she 
is not shy this episode to ask for exactly what she wants. For the very first time, you don't have to leave me alone in bed at dawn. I forgot about that. I didn't. Mm. I know, and then she says something about, so this room is soundproof? Yeah. And I did have one thought about like, oh, right, because Jessica's in the next room. <laughs> but she's a vampire with vampire hearing, which we find out at the end of this episode is not <laughs> right, right. right. There um, are things in these episodes sometimes where we are starting to get into that true blood thing where to keep the story interesting and moving yeah. forward, we have to suspend. Yes. I did make one note that I'll reference in a minute, you know, but but for the moment, I'll I'll leave that. <laughs> it just sort of entertained me when when I have these thoughts like does Suki watch the show <laughs> apparently she does not uh, well I'll say what it is now is when yeah. she goes you know she's needed now so she's yeah. valuable she's got a job to do Bill's not valuable he's yes. sort of right he, the tables have been turned he's he's very sort of I mean I, I wrote sad sack but I think he's just sort of <laughs> He's very down on himself this episode. Yeah. He doesn't he's feel very powerful. He's down on himself. Yeah. Yeah, he's like, I can't protect you, Suki. You got to stay in the room. And, <laughs> and, you know, and then he'll say, she is not doing that. And she's like, no, I am doing that. Yeah. You know, so she says she's going to go in and she's going to infiltrate the the fellowship. And she goes, I'll be in and out. Easy peasy. And I wrote, <laughs> does she not watch the show? <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. But it is it is interesting. I mean, she is definitely sort of ascended in power over mm -hmm. Bill this episode, yeah. which again fits right in line with our idea here that she is more independent than him. She is not beholden to Eric as a sheriff or as right. an elder, only right. within this deal that she made with him. So in many ways, she's a lot freer in this situation than Bill is. Yeah. And and actually Bill says it very interestingly. Well, here I am, responsible for you and Jessica. And yet, no decisions are mine. And it makes me feel... Like a human? Like a waitress. Yep, the tables have turned. Yeah. So interesting, just by changing location. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, and I think he's a little parental with Suki this episode. <laughs> right, is, right. is the only word That's I can true. kind of come up with. He's sort of... Yeah, yeah. Don't do this, do this. He's just her escort and her protector really here. And I wonder, though, if some of that is because he can't keep up really mm -hmm. with her when she mm -hmm. is the lead. And I, I think that that's interesting for him as a man, as a mm -hmm. man of a certain generation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, I think she does a really good job of kind of educating him this episode. Yes. There's an interesting moment where he says that Eric won't listen to a girl and mm -hmm. she corrects him and says, no, a woman. Mm -hmm. And she tells him, you know, look, I'm good at this. I'm good at the mind reading and at the espionage mm -hmm. stuff. And mm -hmm. you have to start trusting me. You always said I was more than a waitress. And mm -hmm. now you're getting a little bit of a taste of what it's like to be told you're not. She really steps up for herself this episode, I think. Mm -hmm. So we end this episode with Speaking one of, of the spicy. sexiest moments. Speaking mm -hmm. of spicy, one of the spiciest moments Again, of Suki, I think, owning what she wants at the end of this night. It's been a long night. Don't feel like you have to. Quit talking crazy. I just meant that I'd be satisfied to simply hold you. Well, I would not be satisfied. Not one bit. Then what do you want, Sucky? Say it. I want you. Every which way. I just want you. Mm. Oh, that's hot. <laughs> that's hot, Deb. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, and then, yes, oh this dear. Is, this is what Lorena listens to as she enters to uh, to ruin yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Of course. And that's true blood.
And now I am so thrilled to introduce the interview with the sexy, engaging, triple threat, one of the few Ooh. actual Southern actresses <laughs> who on the show, her role grows and grows. You all know her. It's Anna Kemp. Hi. Hi. Hi, guys. How are you? <laughs> Hi. Good. Thank you. We're so It's been so long. I know. I know. So good to see you. It's good to see it's, you, beautiful ladies. It's been ladies. so fun, though, watching all of your work these past couple of weeks. <laughs> oh. Checking, yeah, oh, thanks for watching. The, days, the old days. That means so much to me. I appreciate yeah. it. Truly my most favorite job I've ever had. No and kidding. I just really? really, I miss the character uh, so much, but the cast especially. Yeah. Like, there's been no yeah. other job that I've ever had that was that magical. Really, truly. I know. So I'm yeah. already crying. I know. <laughs> One day, it's who really, knows? Who knows? We can jump right in with audition story. Yeah. You want to tell us how you got the part? Yes, I would love to. It's a it's a crazy story, funny story. Actually. Everyone has um, an interesting true audition <laughs> story. I'm so, this is amazing. And no one yet has been yeah. like, oh, I just read and then I got it, you know? No, this was definitely a very crazy, interesting story. So I was doing a play on Broadway at the time called Equus. And I got an audition to put myself on tape for the role of Suki Stackhouse. Okay. So I, I taped for it. Um, and then like a week or so went by and they said, so they, HBO wants to fly you out to test you for yeah. the role. And it was wow. my very first pilot test wow. ever. Oh my and gosh. they flew me out, you know, and they put me up in some fancy hotel down near Santa Monica. Yeah. And I'm like, oh my God, like this is so <laughs> exciting. And yeah. um, I just thought the script was incredible. And like, you know, she's this blonde Southern girl and I was like oh my gosh this is so exciting and then they said well you're testing against one other person and I was like oh great that's that's great fun like how lovely but they put me into a room alone right and so I was like oh well this is interesting I'm starting to catch on now so maybe this person might be a famous person you know like uh a name. So, so I didn't know who it was. And then, you know, Anna, they're ready for you. And I, I walked down the hall and all of a sudden the doors open where all of HBO is and where Alan Ball oh. is and out walks Anna Paquin. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, Oh, oh, my oh. God. and my, my heart, you know, got excited a, because it's Anna Paquin. And then it definitely sank because I said, Oh, well, she has an Oscar and oh. she's Anna Paquin. So she's definitely oh, going to get things this. Are so hard. Um, oh yeah. Oh yeah. So I walk in and I'm like, man, I wish I hadn't seen her. And I, I do the scenes. They give me a couple notes. We do it. I walk out, I immediately throw the sides in the trash and I'm oh. like, well, mm. that was my first pilot audition. It's fine. It's fine. Mm. And then the show gets obviously picked up and, and it's just a huge hit and the season goes by and then I get a call from my agents and they say, so Alan wants to offer you a role in season two. And That's I was like, so okay. classy that he didn't make you audition <laughs> yeah. again. It was the nicest thing ever. So it began to sort of make me realize that you can perform really well in something, but not be right for that particular thing. But because yeah. I was prepared and they saw something in me, uh, you know, it mm -hmm. came back around, which is yeah, really, really it. incredible. So of course yes. I said, whatever, whatever Alan Ball wants, <laughs> 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 you know, and, and then I read the character description and, um, you know, crazy preacher's wife, um, <laughs> was very exciting to me. And yeah, so yeah. I said, so I said yes immediately and then went out to LA and, you know, had the first table read and that's where I met the incredible Michael McMillan and yeah. all of you guys. Oh. <laughs> Those table reads. Like, do you remember that first table read? Yes, I do remember that first table read. I was very nervous <laughs> yes. um, because the show was a huge hit at that time. And, you know, I'd been yeah. watching and 
saw all of the cast. And But I will say that Michael McMillan, who played Steve Newland, directly yes. came over to me and gave me this huge hug <laughs> and was just like, oh, we're going to be, you know, having a lot of fun this season. And I was like, yeah, oh. we are. And then we did the table read and it went so good. And I felt like Sarah came naturally to me. I grew up around women who were very faith-based and who were very, you know, straight, straight down the line. You know, my mother never owned a pair of blue jeans. You know, she always wore like khaki pants and she wore pantyhose under her shorts and, you know, (laughs) that kind of thing. So I I grew up around women like that. What a great, great detail that is, you know, and and only you would know that specifically. Amazing. Yeah. And, and, and the other weird things like my mom. Yeah. Well, that's another podcast. (laughs) (laughs) My mom, well, she would wear rubber gloves to like pick up our cats because she did didn't want to wash her hands so much because she didn't want her hands to age. You know what I mean? So very, you know, but also her family business was the funeral home. So I also had this sort of growing up around like death and and morbid, you know, type Mm -hmm. things. I don't know if that played into it, but it felt just so natural to, to be Sarah, I know that is a little scary (laughs) of a thing to say, (laughs) but it felt really comfortable in a way. And it felt very freeing. I felt like, especially at those table reads, whenever we would, you know, have the the line, the scenes or the jokes or whatever to play out, I felt very free. I didn't feel like I could fail there, which was something that I haven't really felt. I I felt before in other table reads, but that was a a special one where I never was Mm. Nervous. I was more excited to right. to see what they were, what the wonderful writers were giving us and giving yeah. me. It's mm-hmm. an incredible thing to be in the hands of great writers, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and they well, are especially some of the best to writers. have them then control the evolution of a character over years. So mm-hmm. much of her is, as a maybe more traditional valued values woman. Mm-hmm. You know, where do you find your power and your identity within that? And I've always sort of I was so amazed by your performance and really like bringing that to the surface that even though she's an antagonist and a little scary and a little funny, that we see this humanity in her that's like searching mm-hmm. for something, which is so exciting. She's definitely one to commit, right? Yeah. Like she commits to what she right. wants and what who she is in the moment. <laughs> she might right. change who she is, but she definitely is committed and she's unabashedly herself yeah. also, right. which I fo- found very empowering to play. And perhaps that's a reason why, you know, fans could not only, you know, hate her, but hopefully love to hate her yeah, because mm-hmm. she was an empowered woman as psychotic as she was <laughs> and completely uh, unabashedly herself and passionate about what she wanted to accomplish. So I think that's what it, it takes to be a, a good villain and mm-hmm. also someone that you, you love to hate, which is always a character I love to play. So yeah. I got very lucky. <laughs> That's so interesting that you said that because really she is a hundred percent herself all the time with no, in the moment, no sort of insecurities or self-reflection or, you know what I mean? She's not mm-hmm. like, am I doing the right thing? She's really, mm-hmm. you know, she, you know, I love in season two, how everything that she wants to do is what God wants, yes. right? Yes. So even when she's seducing Jason, Jason, she brings up Mary Magdalene. She says, God wants you to have a reward, Jason. <laughs> Let me reward you. Let me help you find your way back to joy. Oh, oh, and I mean, there is something about religion and sex. I don't know what it is. There is. Know, there just there's is. Something about prohibition, it. maybe. It's, it's, you're you not know. supposed to be doing it, right? right. Anything that you're right. not supposed to be doing becomes incredibly seductive. Yeah. yeah. And I also don't know how, you know, pleased she was in the bedroom with Mr. Newland. <laughs> you know, I'm not sure. <laughs> Strong point. Yeah. And then what are you supposed to do with the lovely Jason Stackhouse? Yeah. I, mean, I mean, you know, on. he's living in your home. What are you supposed <laughs> to do with that? I have, you know. I know. The, the God, yes, God told her to and among other things, told her to do that. Definitely. <laughs> yeah, but she is coming from, she. you know, one of the other things she kept saying is praise his light, praise his light. Yes. And I think that a lot of the time in season two, she was really working from a place of love and light yes. and yes. joy and kindness. In the beginning, I think she's coming from a very 
God driven, lovely, light place. You know, Sarah Newland mm-hmm. is so grounded in your performance of her, and she does such crazy things. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but each moment is so rich. And oh, thanks. That, right. So, like the next moment, your reaction, and then your next reaction, I wouldn't expect. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. it's fresh. It's like, oh, she's a killer. Oh, she feels bad about it. Yeah. Oh, she's recovering. Oh, she, you know, and the dialogue, the stuff that, I mean, there was a funny one I saw on YouTube. I had to write down. Yeah. You probably it's, get some of the same questions as Kristen, like favorite lines, because Sarah has oh, some yeah. singers in the same way oh, yeah. that, uh, that Pam did. You Definitely. Had so many good, but crazy lines. Like, yeah. And if you had gone for the comedy or the surface, it wouldn't be the same. Yeah. Yeah, you know, you. like ye, th- ye though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Die, fuckers! <laughs> oh, no. oh my god, I forgot about that one. Oh my god, so many good ones, but yeah. but coming yes. from a place of truth, you know, I don't, I never yeah. wanted to play. I never wanted to wink at the audience that I knew this was a joke. Like I always want people to look at the characters I create as if they're really living that in Mm. the moment and they're very Mm -hmm. present and they're discovering things in Mm. the moment. You like in season two, when I come into the bedroom and I, I sit with Ryan on the bed, you know, it's yes, the lines were there and the dialogue is there, but what do I really want? I want Mm. him I want him to kiss me. Oh God, no, no, no. I can't feel that. I can't feel that. I can't feel that. I can't feel that. I want him to, I want to comfort him. I want to make sure that he knows he's comfortable in the house because then maybe he'll kiss me. Maybe he'll kiss me. Do you know what I mean? It's all of those, but, but maybe, no, but I can't be feeling that I'm married. I'm married. I'm married. You know what I mean? There's all of these things that, that we're juggling. And that's a real testament to the writers for writing Com- putting characters in very complex situations where they're right. having very internal struggles with what's going yeah. on as well as, as these external things that they're they're yeah. battling against. But yeah. I think it was so multi-layered and complex. And just the lines, like you were saying, I just was remembering another one where I'm where I'm talking about how God is wanting me to do these things. And I just say, God wants me to fuck you. <laughs> you <know? laughs> only on like, True Blood. Oh God, only on True Blood would you get a line like that. You know, and and actually, so it works. You know, like it's not; <laughs> it doesn't end up being horrible. It's like actually a gold line. It, um, yeah. Thank you know, God! Thank God! Yeah. 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 yeah, and we talked a little bit about Michael McMillan, but now yes. Ryan, who is one of my yes. favorite people to work with on the show, and yeah. you got to have such an interesting arc with him from yeah. mentor to lover to antagonist to all of it. Yeah, mm-hmm. tell us a little bit about meeting him and working with him and what that was like. I think I even like had a work session with him for Sookie way back in the day, like way back. Um, And I was like, who is this like incredibly handsome human being? Oh my goodness. But no, just seeing him on set and how, how talented and creative. And then he, he would just, every take would be different and connected Uh and surprising. Mm -hmm. And he would take, risks in a way that I don't think I'd ever seen on a TV set, at least like I had never been in a a television situation with another actor who was so game to play. Mm -hmm. And also when you added Michael McMillan into that, like when we shot that barbecue scene, Oh my God. Like we were just, we were operating on a level where every character seemed like they were perfectly cast (laughs) and they were very, supportive and free free and game to play so i can close my eyes right now and i can be back in that kitchen shooting the scene where i come in and bring the barbecue we're all sitting around and we're like god wants you to and like i'm putting the bib on him (laughs) and i'm like petting him down like you know it just was it was such a magical moment to feel like we're all operating on the cylinders that we need to be operating on it was really (sighs) magical that the both the grilling scene because there's the slow mo yeah. like Jason's <laughs> fantasy <laughs> uh, yes. moment, Music and then video. there's <laughs> the scene of all of you at the table, and it did feel like I don't know, I could feel the playful joy coming off of both yeah. those scenes. I don't know if a lot of it was 
not improvised, but sort of just you guys coming up with ideas. Can you, yeah, tell us about that day. What was that like? <laughs> Oh my gosh. Well, I mean, I knew that I had this weird fantasy, you know, sequence that we had to shoot outside. And I remember uh, just going for it, you know, like no one told me to lick a beer bottle. Sorry, mom. (laughs) (laughs) You know, no one said to do that. But I remember that I, I, I did that. And I remember, I think Bucky was um, yeah. on set. And I, and I remember being like, was that okay? <laughs> you know what I mean? like, was that okay to do? And he was like, uh, yeah, Anna, uh-huh. Uh-huh. I think that'll make it into the cut. You like I go too we'll, far. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think we're on, you're on true blood. Like you're uh, fine. Um, so it was uh, just like, it was a freedom and the, the cameras would roll and I would just like go for it and have a blast and, and not really care you know, what I looked like in the moment and just like go for it. And then they would call cut and I would be like, Ooh, I was like, what did I do? What did I do? Oh God. Oh God. The whole set is like, but you know what? In the end of the day, what all that matters is what ends up, you know, in that little black tunnel that we're shooting that ends up on the, on the screen. And I'm so happy that it turned out the way that it did. So it was a, it was one of the funnest days I ever had on that show for sure. I want to ask about the look yeah. because the okay. Sarah Newland yes. look is so, I mean, the hair, yeah. down to the oh. manicure, the yeah. costumes, the, I mean, all of, I mean, how much input did you have? Was there an inspiration? Yeah. Talk to us about like the Sarah Newland presentation. First of all, I loved every part of it so much. Um, it's her hair, her hair so definitely good. got bigger <laughs> each episode, I believe. Um, there were there was this um, tele evangelist couple. I forget the name of them right now, but her hair was definitely you know sculpted. And mm. um, we all know the phrase, the higher the hair, the closer to God. That's right. Oh, right. You know. <laughs> um, so we would sit there and we would tease that whole wow. thing up so intensely. And I just, you know, thought that when she's talking and she's in class, she just likes to talk with her hands. So she would have to get her nails done as every good Texan, yes. you know, woman would have that long French manicure. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I know Audrey put me in a lot of, like golds um, yes. and like yellows, you know, yeah. to represent light and the light from God and all of yeah. that stuff. So, you know, we're curious if, if you can remember if there are any scenes that were particularly memorable for you. Uh, yeah. Things that sort of stuck in your mind, stories about scenes. Yeah. Like a favorite, not favorite or challenging or, okay. you know, yeah. fun. Um, well, I was really nervous to shoot the holy hand job scene. Um. Uh-huh. <laughs> very nervous to shoot the bathtub scene. Definitely. I was oh, like, what am I going to, how am I going to do, like, how do we do this? You know what yeah. I mean? Like, where do I put my hand? And like, right. how, how does did this, you, do? you know, work? Oh God, I might've blocked it out a little bit. Um, <laughs> I, I, I do remember, I do remember like a props person saying, do you want a hairbrush? <laughs> like something to hold <laughs> down there. To hold. And I remember oh. going, I'm okay. <laughs> yeah. Like, I'm I okay. Have, I, I don't think imagine. we need a prop. <laughs> yeah. So I just sweet. imagine yeah. that. Um, but they were so sweet. Very sweet. And I was like, yeah. no, thank you, though. But yeah, we, we got through that. And you know, when you shoot those scenes where you have these like sexual encounters and you, 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 <laughs> like, I remember feeling moved afterwards to be like, was it good for you? Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? like was that okay? You know what I mean? Was that okay? Yeah. Like you have this feeling of, I just simulated a sexual act with you yeah. and being like a giving partner. I want to make sure that it was like, yeah. okay for you kind of thing. Yeah. So that, that was definitely the scene that like, I was the most nervous by, you know, right. obviously. Sure. Yeah. One of my other questions was when you hear true blood, is it possible to come up with three descriptive words, adjectives that come to mind? Oh my gosh. <laughs> I mean, I'm just not going to think about it too much then. Yeah. Well, while we're on the topic, it's very sexy. It is. Sexy. It's a sexy show. Yep. Freeing. Mm. Freeing. Freeing. Oh yeah, you mentioned. Mm. That's great. And when I also think a bit dangerous. Ooh. Yeah. Love that. 
you know, because you're given these these scenes and these characters and these situations that, I mean, can we sell this? Can we sell that these people right. are shape-shifting? Yeah. Can we sell <laughs> all of this material? And, you know, on the other flip of the coin, dangerous, it's just a, a dangerous world that right. these characters are navigating. So, yeah, yeah. I think I think sexy, freeing, and dangerous. Amazing. Wow, that's great. <laughs> That's so true. Well, we are grateful that we got to talk with you and oh, go over thanks. all this stuff. I know. And it thank is you so for coming lovely on. To, like, because we work together, but yeah. I don't know what was going on over there. <laughs> no, I know. I have no idea what was kind of. going on with you guys. Definitely, <laughs> we like cross paths a couple a couple times. Yeah. But I always admired both of your work so much, um, oh, and I, I just thought that you were also so lovely and professional. To, to work with and I was very excited whenever I got a script seeing that we would have scenes together yeah. so um yeah, I'm very very grateful that you guys asked me to come on and talk about one of my favorite jobs that I've ever yes. had in my whole life oh, yay. oh Deb that yeah. really the way she said if I could close my eyes and be back there, I have that yeah. feeling again, talking to Anna, just, she's so freaking wonderful. I, I mean, even just watching her stuff this last week and, and getting yes. back, just every single character, no matter what their scope is on this show, yeah. it's so fully realized. And, and I yeah. love chatting with her about grounding such an intense, insane character. It's so easy to just write Sarah Nulan off as a stereotype, right? But yeah. she put in the work and made her something so unique and memorable. I'm, I'm so impressed by everyone we have on. <laughs> Me too. And when she talks about a scene, like the lingerie walking yeah. into the bedroom and thinking, I want him to kiss me. And now I want to go back and watch that scene again. Yeah. I just watched it last night. Absolutely. Really lovely to see her and hear her. And she has the sweetest laugh in the world, She's I think. the greatest. I hope she'll come back. Me too. Next week on Truest Blood, deception, red herrings, and lies. Oh my. How is one to know who to trust? Next episode, the tides begin to turn and true motives are revealed. And we speak with the charming Ashley Jones about playing the mysterious Daphne Landry, as well as her long-standing soap opera career, moving into directing, and all the artistic wisdom she's learned along the way. She is a soulful speaker, so be sure you don't miss it. Thanks for listening, Trubies. Subscribe and follow wherever you listen to your podcasts, and we'll see you next week. Y'all come back now, you hear. Got any burning questions you want answered on Truest Blood? Post them on any and all social media platforms using hashtag FangClubQuestions, and we may feature them on the show. That's hashtag F-A-N-G-C-L-U-B-Q-U-E-S-T-I-O-N-S. Truest Blood is produced by Safe Haven for HBO Max. Executive producers are Janina Kavankar, Kristen Bauer, and Deborah Ann Wool. Our producer is Gabrielle Gallon, and our audio producer is Christopher Wool. Our theme song was recorded just for this podcast by Jace Everett. Additional music was composed by Timo Chen. And remember, you can watch all of the original episodes of True Blood on HBO Max.